Welcome to the online quantum technology meeting on Qubit Large Scale Generation. Be prepared to hear something awesome. In quantum computing, qubits are the basic units for quantum information. So how do we generate them? And how many qubits can we generate today? And what role does photonics play? We are looking for people with vision. And here is a clear world-class success story. It's called Psi Quantum. Perhaps the best explanation of the challenges ahead comes from my former colleague at Bristol University, Jeremy O'Brien, who spoke pure wisdom at the World Economic Forum. Vast data centers to mobile phones, the power of computers continues to transform our lives. But there are some problems uh, across artificial intelligence, in the design of new materials, pharmaceuticals, and clean energy devices that they will simply never solve. So even if we turned our entire planet into a giant supercomputer, we wouldn't be able to solve these and many other important problems. The good news is that if we could build a computing device based on fundamental quantum principles, we could. What we've come to today is the ability to manufacture a quantum computer based on light using the semiconductor industry as we know it today. So these silicon wafers contain millions of computer chips and each of those chips contains billions of computers. It is such a beautiful story which I witnessed firsthand. In 2007, Jeremy and his team managed to realize a logical CNOT gate in silicon photonics. Fast forward a few years later, as the integrated photonics technology matured, they realized three different applications in a photonic integrated circuit. Photon generation, state manipulation, and quantum interference. Isn't it wonderful when the real photonic innovation appears on the front page of the Wall Street Journal? On Wednesday, December 1st, I hope we can discover more about the current state of play in the crazy world of qubits and photonics. Let's review the down-to-earth advances of quantum computers using photonic integrated circuits. And what other advances do we need from big foundries, assembly companies, and the rest of the supply chain? And how do the photonics qubit compare to the ion qubits of ion Q, the diamond qubits of quantum brilliance, and the superconducting qubits of giants like Google or IBM? Falcon R10 is very exciting, as we have measured a 2Q gate breaking the 0.001 error per gate plane. So now in addition to the announcement that we've broken the 100 qubit barrier with Eagle, we have a second major announcement. We're proud to say in recent weeks, we've broken the 0.001 error per gate barrier. I really can't wait for this one. See you on Wednesday, December 1st at 3 p.m. And it is Wednesday, December 3rd, December 1st, and it's 3 p.m. and you are all here. We have a large amount of people in the room, a large amount of people in YouTube, the business, the business of Panagiotis Pergiris, Dr. Panagiotis and myself, is to make sure that you connect today and you do business. Our business is that people do business and business is good. I am really happy to be here today speaking on behalf of the European Photonic Industry Consortium. Many of you know that we reached the, bar the border of 750 members last week. Nokia became member, 756 members right now, and we keep growing, but this means nothing. That's just a number. What really matters is that we are 16 people who dedicate our life to the photonic industry. We dedicate every single second of our life to connect companies and we love photonics. We organize events, provide access to the network, help you raise capital. We have the biggest website in the world to find a job in photonics and help you with providing you with market reports. Today, I am very happy to say that the season five of the quantum meetings is reaching the end and we finished with the one that everybody wanted to talk about. So very excited about this. Also for the photonics events, we are reaching the end of season five. It was fantastic season. On Monday, next week, medical devices, please sign up for this one. And for those of you who are wondering what are the topics for after Christmas, we already have announced them. They are in the website. And of course, we are addressing quantum technologies because we love quantum technology. So make sure that you register as soon as possible for these meetings today. 
today is all about qubit generation. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the cooperation that we have with the Quantum Business Network. Thank you very much for the amazing job that you are doing, bringing industry and investment to the quantum technologies. And also I would like to say for the people who don't know, these meetings are not possible without the support of our sponsors. And today our sponsors are coming all the way from Copenhagen and KT Photonics. They provide ultra stable, multiple free lasers with extremely narrow line width and high power. QTech, all the way from the Netherlands, 300 bright scientists and engineers, and a local ecosystem of companies creating a scalable prototypes of quantum internet and quantum computing. And coming all the way from Lausanne, beautiful Lausanne next to the lake, Ligent Tech, silicon nitride manufacturing of photonic internet circuits. And actually what they do in quantum is quite fascinating. They work already with the Canadian company Sanadu, who recently showed quantum computing with different algorithms on the same photonic internet circuit, and that chip was from Ligentech. They are fascinating, as fascinating as my quantum colleague coming all the way from Italy with a Greek name and a lot of energies is Dr. Bergiris. Congratulations on what you have done today. Amazing. What's going to happen in the next two hours? Panas. Panos, we may have a problem with Panos sound, but now, can tell you. yes, can we can hear you not clear. I was just thanking you for introduction. Uh, I'm very happy for uh, the today's meeting. Uh, it's going to be amazing. We have uh, here, uh, we show you the, the typical order of our speakers. And uh, if we can go uh, to our supply chain uh, here, I would like to show you that we cover the full value of the supply, uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the full uh, uh, supply chain. Uh, we have end users that are super interested in uh, into quantum computing. We have people for, from um, uh, the semiconductor industry, uh, like lithography and manufacturers. We have testing and instrumentation. Uh, we have uh, all the way uh, up to uh, photonic integrated circuits. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the representatives of quantum computing, uh, random generators, and quantum cryptography. And we cannot do quantum computing without lasers. We have our laser manufacturers. Um, uh, photonic components and whatever else, it's uh, really important uh, for uh, achieving quantum computing, uh, 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 bringing it to the, the next level. Thank you so much, Panos. This slide corresponds to the companies who registered for the meeting today. So you are an Epic member and you don't see your logo there. Only means you forgot to register. Don't let it happen again. Go to the website, find which meetings you are interested in attending and register as soon as possible. And this meeting, all of you know, is live streaming YouTube. So hello, YouTubers of the world. If you have any questions, put it in the chat. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.pozo.epic-asoc.com. And I would love to make that introduction. My throat is working, right? The sound is so-so, but it's okay. Because what I'm about to say is very important. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time at an epic meeting, the quantum computing success story of photonic internet circuits, Psy Quantum, represented by their chief technology officer and good friend, Mark Thompson. Mark, thank you so much. We will talk yesterday at 10 p.m. Thank you so much for accepting being with us, being with my 756 friends today, I really want to welcome you to our community. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for the invite. And uh, it's great to see so many people online. Do you know what it is? This, the secret of this community is that we love the epic question, which is what can you do for the others? And what can the others do for you? What we do here once a week for two hours, we meet and we share challenges because we do believe that what one company does as a unique selling point should solve the technology bottleneck of another. So that's why for me it was super important that you are here. You told me by email that you have some slides to show us and I would like to see them and also to discuss with the rest of the community how you can help us and how we can maybe help you. Mark, the floor and the attention of everyone, we are global today, goes to you. Hey, thanks, Jose. Great. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to uh, just give a you know a brief overview of you know who we are and uh, and what we're doing. So hopefully, my slide sharing. Crystal clear. Excellent. Great. Yeah. So uh, you know we're Psy Quantum. We're uh, a as you know a quantum computing company. We're based in the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, yeah, we've uh, we've been around now for about five years. Uh, we're about 150 in staff. We've raised uh, a sum total of about $650 million backed by some of the, the world's most well-known VC investors. And the sole focus and mission of the company is really quite simple. We are going to build the world's first large-scale fault-tolerant error-corrected quantum computer. 
are obviously not the only people making that claim, but this is the clear focus and mission of our company. And large scale fault tolerant and error corrected are really just scientific jargon for useful. We're building useful quantum computers that can solve meaningful problems across a, a wide range of applications within science and technology. Uh, we're particularly passionate around the use of quantum computers in climate and healthcare and energy and the high tech sector. And really what common quantum computers allow us to do is take previously impossible problems and make them possible uh, in key areas uh, of, of, of technology exploration particularly. Uh, and so this is a revolutionary technology that will really ultimately propel uh, a new generation of technology discovery and advancements in a wide array of different areas. Now, to be able to realize useful quantum computers, you know, the natural question to ask is, well, how big and how powerful machine do we need to be able to deliver on these meaningful applications? And when you do a, you know, a survey of the applications and algorithms out there that we know of now, and you look at how many qubits do you need and how many computational gate operations do you need? You know, there's a few examples here of uh, work in battery chemistry, so simulation of lithium ion battery chemistry uh, on quantum compute systems, cracking of RSA codes, uh, the Fermico molecule, which is a, a catalyst in fertilizer production, Fermi Hubbard models for simulation of high temperature superconductors. You see that in order to perform useful applications, you require billions of computational gate operations on hundreds to thousands of logical qubits. And that's the regime that you need to be in to do useful quantum computation. And therefore, error correction is absolutely crucial and something that we call fault tolerance. And so without error correction, you operate in this regime that we call noisy intermediate scale quantum systems. And you'll have heard a lot about that from people like Google. And with those systems, you can do tens, maybe hundreds of computational gate operations before the noise builds up and your whole system just falls over. If you want to do something useful, you've got to be in that billions of qubit, uh, that billions of computational gate operation regime, and you'd be down at logical error rates in the sort of 10 to the minus 12. And the hard reality of the story is that to get into that regime, you need lots and lots and lots of qubits. You need to be in the millions of physical qubit regimes to be able to get there. So uh, scaling is the number one challenge, uh, no matter how good uh, your individual qubits are, unless those qubits can scale to the millions, you're never going to have a useful quantum computer. And so at Cyquan and we, you know, we, we, we baked in scaling from really early on in the philosophy of the company. We identified these four scaling challenges of manufacturability, control, connectivity, and calling power. Um, and I won't go into too much detail about these. We can talk about them more if, you, if, if people are interested. Uh, but it's, you know, it's our provocation that photonics as a qubit technology is uniquely positioned to tackle all of these four scaling challenges that you need to be able to achieve large scale useful quantum computing. And you know, just to add a little bit of color to that, you know, we teamed up with Global Foundries a couple of years ago to really tackle head on that manufacturing challenge. Uh, we've worked with Global Foundries to bring up a full quantum photonic fabrication flow for the generation, manipulation, and detection of quantum states of light within silicon photonic integrated circuits. And to give you an idea of some of the challenges that we face there, uh, bringing the superconducting detector technology into the CMOS fabrication flow, where we have these detectors based on niobium nitride thin films. Uh, they work incredibly well. They have almost 100% single photon detection efficiency. So that's attowatts for those in the telecom industry, that's minus 160 dBm sensitivity. Uh, these devices operate about four Kelvin. And you know, we've developed those device technologies. There's some examples of what those devices look like. And you know, working with the likes of global foundries, we get incredible levels of control and precision. So uh, nanowick variations of a nanometer and thin thickness variations of sub angstrom and incredible levels of performance. We also leverage the rest of the semiconductor supply chain, assembly, manufacturing, and packaging chain to really bring all this technology together. So we have electronic devices uh, fabricated in 22 FDX, also at Global Foundries. These operate very well at cryogenic temperatures. We use hybrid packaging and um, bonding techniques to allow us to integrate the photonic and electronic together. So we get tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of electrical connections are possible between our photonic qubits and our electrical control circuits. We use large port fiber optic arrays, we're up to 100 port fiber optic arrays uh, connected to our photonic chips that allow us to couple 
qubits in and out of these systems. And you know, the scaling of our technology is not only through the manufacturability of the technology, it's through this optical connectivity, the ability to use fiber optics to optically connect and distribute our qubits across the system. And so the vision of the company is very much to create a large scale photonic quantum computer based on these core photonic modules that are optically and electrically connected in this distributed quantum compute system. So that's really you know, who we are in a nutshell and, and what our, our vision, our ambition is. So thank you for allowing me to take the floor. You know what, Mark, I'm gonna tell you in confidence. When you told me that you were gonna share some slides, I thought you were gonna talk about how cool are quantum computers. I, I didn't know that you were gonna mention global foundries. I didn't know you were gonna mention those detectors, your packaging challenges. That was a, a glad surprise. I wasn't prepared for that and I loved it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Mark. We have something here which is called the epic question, which is what can you do for the others and what can the others do for you? I wonder if you could share with us one or two challenges, one or two uh, things that perhaps you are you, you can collaborate further with uh, global foundries or maybe other companies can help you in this successful collaboration that you have mm. with them? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, for, for us, we've, over the last four years or so, we put a lot of attention into the kind of the core components and the core component technologies. And that's, you know, still very important for us, you know, achieving very high performance optical uh, technologies, so high performance optical switches, High performance, you know, chip to fiber interconnects, you know, low loss components that's still, you know, a, a strong interest for us. But, but we're definitely moving now more in the direction of the, the scaling, the systemization, the packaging challenges, you know, operating larger, more complicated systems at cryogenic temperatures, uh, you know, the control, the electronic control, the interactions with the, with the photonics, the thermals, the dynamics of these systems. So we're definitely, you know, now moving where we see, you know, most of our say next stage of challenges are really at that systemization level. I have talking about good questions. I have very good questions in the chat. The first one is coming all the way from Copenhagen, super continuum generation in style, NKT Photonics. Asger Jensen, great to have you in the room. What's on your mind? Hi, Jose. Great Thank you for you. having us. Yeah, my question is, um, there's been a lot of talk about the market, oh, sorry, the, uh, the business model for quantum computers. And uh, one model, of course, being uh, supplying quantum computing as a service another for those who wants to be in control of their own hardware. So my question is, how do you see the split between the two in the coming years and how will it uh, develop? Yeah, I think it's a, a great question. I mean, quantum compute and particularly when you're getting into the regime of solving hard application problems, uh, that is a very specialist area, like mapping a, a problem that industry is interested to onto the specific hardware of a quantum computer um, is, is a big challenge. And we certainly see, at least in the early days, that you know, as, a, as a service, as a company, we will be working very, very closely with the industries that want to solve problems and effectively you know, working with them to produce solutions to their problems. So yeah, time is one option. You can you know, sell by the, by the minute, by the dollar time access to your quantum computer. But I think what's more valuable to people is actually the provision of solutions based on that technology. Uh, and so really working closely to provide solutions, not necessarily time and dollar accounting of quantum compute time. I mean, there are, you know, there are people who are doing that now. Uh, and I think that's very useful to the community for people to be able to get early access uh, to the hardware itself. Uh, but ultimately, it's about providing solutions to hard problems in industry. Coming all the way from Germany, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, but he's in a stealth mode. So he told me from the University of Ulm, in a stealth mode from a quantum company, Ish Dand. Ish, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, what do you have for Mark? Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks, Jose, and thanks, Mark. Um, so I wanted to ask about switches, which you already just mentioned. So uh, low loss, fast switching on a chip, of course, is uh, super important for photonic quantum computing. Um, what can you tell us about uh, PsyQuantum's approach here in terms of materials or processes, given that um, silicon might not be the best material for it, uh, to the best of my understanding? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I, I won't and can't get into too much of the technical details, other than to say that switching is a, a really important problem for all of photonics. Uh, you know, it's very clear that, you know, we're starting to hit the limits 
in terms of what silicon photonics can achieve for the, the data com and telecom industry. And so it's very clear that there's a need for a new generation of switching technologies. And of course, you know, we're very interested in that and we're putting a lot of effort and pushing the, the boundaries in that area very much so. Uh, but I think it's a problem that everybody cares about. I think there's a, a bunch of problems in photonic quantum computing that really everyone should care about. I mean, maybe, maybe we're caring about it, you know, a, a few years earlier than others, but really fast, low loss, high performance optical switches, uh, chip to fiber optical interconnects are another area where it's very critical for you know, the, the scaling of, of quantum, quantum compute systems. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not gonna say much more about the technologies that we're pursuing, but certainly a new type of switching technology is required. Thank you very Thanks. much, Mark. And I really appreciate that you are providing us with these hints. Thank you so much. Ish, I know you are in a stealth mode, but do you want to take this opportunity to tell us maybe in one or two sentences what you are doing? Um, sorry, but this might be a little bit too early. Uh, maybe in the next, uh, next message meeting for Qubit Generation, apologies. Okay, I take that as a challenge. In the next meeting, you have to tell us in one slide a little bit of what you do. We continue, you know, I'm always against stealth mode, sorry, Ish. We continue with the next question. This was canceled the way from Switzerland. It's Michael Heiselman, the general manager of the Silicon Nitro Foundry, Lightning Tech. Michael, what's on your mind? Uh, hey, Mark, thanks for the, hey. for the overview. Um, what, uh, what kind of size does the chip need to be? You mentioned uh, we need to allocate uh, a million qubits uh, on uh, on a chip. Uh, so, so what what size? Uh, what's the smallest size you can envision? Yeah, I mean it's a great question. The the bigger the better is the right answer. Uh, interfaces are where all the problems are at in any system that you're trying to build. And so, the less interfaces you have, or the more you can get in the boundaries of your interfaces, then you know the the better you're going to be. So. From our perspective, the, the larger the better. So we're we, we've you know typically looking at reticle sized uh, photonic circuits is is where we're at. Uh, if we could get to wafer sized photonic circuits, then we would definitely be interested. In that. Michael, congratulations on what you are doing with the foundry. Uh... XFAB, scaling silicon nitrate to the semiconductor production from January to 100 millimeter mass fabrication. I'm amazed. Michael, you are an example for this industry. Congratulations, Lion Tech. I want to continue. And now the next question comes from Adia Cherikuri from Quantum Computing. Adia, what's on your mind? Uh, basically, I'm just trying to understand the fundamentals of this technology. Uh, uh, thank you all of you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so what I'm trying to understand here is uh, uh, basically it's the spin of a given particle which defines the qubits, right? So I just want to understand the underlying technology basically. I know I'm just asking a very fundamental question, but trying to understand it in greater detail that how this quantum uh, computing technology really works in, in terms of uh, uh, particles, whether it is bosons or fermions. And Adiya, thank you very much for the question, Mark. Please don't answer. This meeting is really fully on industrial cooperation. Please contact yes. me offline by email and we can have a chat and they can explain the fundamentals. Okay. But That's this is more about fine. industrial cooperation. Thank you so that much, Adiya. I will continue you. in the room and I would like to give the floor to a person that means the world to me and a lot to Epic. Dr. Ana Gonzalez, Director of the, quant of the Quantum Computing but Programmable Photonic Integrated Circuits, Ipronix. Ana, thank you very much. Muchas gracias for being with us. What's on your mind? Thank you, Jose, very much for this nice introduction. And thank you very much, Mark. Very nice uh, presentation. Yes, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more about the, the integration in your, in your device. Uh, are, I mean, do you plan to, to integrate uh, lasers and, and detectors inside the chip or are going to be discrete elements or how do you plan? Yeah, this? so I think the laser questions are a really good one. So the detectors are all, already integrated into our stack. So we use these superconducting single photon detectors. So that's already a, a crucial technology that's, that's fully integrated. The lasers is a great, uh, a great question. And it's a, another question that sort of resonates across other areas of photonics as well. 
uh, the is the laser off chip or on chip question. And so, you know, companies like Intel very much went for the, yes, we're going to integrate the laser on chip and they have an incredible process for that. You know, other companies you know, like uh, I Labs is maybe a good example where they've gone for the laser off chip, right? And you pipe the light into your system. For us, it was a very easy decision that the lasers are off chip. Uh, we operate our chips at cryogenic temperatures uh, to support the superconducting detectors. And so the less heat generation uh, that we have on chip, the better. And of course, lasers, even the best lasers are still pretty hot. Uh, the most efficient lasers are still pretty hot. So uh, keeping the lasers out, out of the cryostat and off the chip was the right decision for us. So we uh, couple in with fiber optics. And uh, Mark, I'm sorry, but you got so much attention. There's so many people who want to know a little bit. Please feel free to not answer if somebody asks something that you don't want to answer, please. Uh, the next question comes from CSEM in Switzerland. They are setting up a foundry of lithium niobite on insulator. Amir Ghadimi, tell us what's on your mind. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, wonderful. Hello, Mark. Thank you so much for that very nice presentation. Actually, just a little bit following up uh, on the previous question, this you know switching times uh, and you know sort of uh, the, the the limitations you might actually have on the silicon. So maybe you know can you be like more quantitative? What is your desired switching time? And then kind of also a second question I have is about this uh, single photon actually you know detectors based on superconducting nanowires. Is this already integrated in a sort of a global foundries process flow or is sort of a post-processing that you guys do? Or, I mean, yeah, it's, so it's I'll, a, answer that. I'll answer the last question first, which is, yeah, it's fully integrated into the CMOS uh, silicon photonics compatible flow. So it's, it's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a fully, you know, I wouldn't say qualified, but it's a fully integrated uh, process. So it's more likely integrated. Uh, then the, the other question switching was time. switching times. Yeah, I mean, we're, I'm not going to talk specific details there, but one of the great advantages of, of photonics is that it's fast, right? When you're looking at uh, photonic computation, you know, quantum photonic computational speeds, it's one of the it's one of the fastest out there. The the, the speed at which you can manipulate yeah, your quantum states, the speed at which you can generate and detect quantum states. Uh, I mean, these detectors uh, ha have, you know, potentially gigahertz uh, detection rates. Uh, and so we want to operate at, you know, the, the, the fastest speed that we can uh, within the system, which is in, in principle, these systems can operate at the gigahertz rates. Okay, so we want to be, so yeah, so we want to be in a position where, you know, the whole, the clock rate of the system, and this is, you know, this is where we're at, the clock rate of the system is into the gigahertz regimes. And so that's where the switches would need to operate at. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mark and Amir. Congratulations on what you are achieving. Switzerland is becoming very strong thanks to Lion Tech and the activities of CSE and Lithium Niabite. You guys are doing a fantastic job. I want to continue with a person who arrives for the first time at an EPIC meeting, the first time that we had Terra Quantum in the room. I saw that they wanted to contribute. So tell us, tell us what's on your mind. Hi, uh, Karani from Terraquantum. I think we'll, we'll be talking later, so we'll introduce uh, the community to ourselves. But um, hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for that. It was really interesting. Uh, I think we actually have a, our chief product officer in San Francisco, so it'd be good to connect you with him nice. as well, Florian. There. Um, but I, I really kind of like how you described the way in which, you know, you know, selling time to the system is one thing in the short term, but in the very, very long term, like 20 years from now, when people are going to be using your your system from an application perspective to solve really hard problems. How do you kind of see that manifesting? Do you see kind of, you know, you guys partnering with other people to offer other parts of the stack that are closer to the application? Or do you see kind of you guys doing the end-to-end -end as well? Just a few kind of thoughts on that. One. Yeah, so it's uh, it's something going to be a lot sooner than 20 years. That's the first uh, uh, answer to that part of that question. Uh, yeah, I mean, the... The, to, certainly when it's a completely new technology and uh, you know you do need to offer a full complete solution and it's I think all of you on this is that you have to have such intimate knowledge of the hardware the architecture to be able to create you know the efficient applications and, and you know compile to compile the applications onto your uh, onto your hardware but that really you know we will definitely engage with partners 
around that, but it's something that very much we need to own. It's not the sort of thing that you can just throw it over the fence to, to somebody else. I think application development and, and the high level you know, algorithm development, I think is something that will come from all sorts of different directions, from other companies, from academia, uh, from you know, industrial partners themselves. But I, I think up to you know, the, say the, the, the firmware of the system, right? Uh, that's certainly you know, right the way up there is something that, that, that any quantum compute company would need to keep tight hold of themselves and really make sure that they fully are understanding and developing and bringing in the right partners to help them solve the full, the full stack. Before Does we let sense? Mark rest in a very well deserved rest, one final question for you is coming all mm -hmm. the way from Eindhoven, from the Indian Phosphite Valley of Europe, is coming from the JPX Pilot Line, Professor Martijn Heck. Martijn, <laughs> what's on your mind? Yeah, uh, thanks for getting the floor, actually. Um, it's uh, maybe more of a statement than a question, but because we talk <clears throat> about uh, lasers and the need for lasers. Um, uh, and of course, lasers can be bought off the shelf. Uh, a question to you and later to the whole community is, uh, would there be a need for customizable dice where you can think about uh, the pitch of the lasers, uh, the, the, amount, the, the, the wavelengths, the power, et cetera, basically customizing and having high density and to which extent a thing like a pilot line for indium phosphide, which you probably are aware of already, uh, whether that could help out. Hey, Martin, good to, good to see you. It's been a while. Uh, yeah, good, 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 good question. So lasers are a critical technology for us. Uh, it's unclear whether the indium phosphide lasers would be the right solutions for our needs. We know we need uh, very, very highly pure uh, optical pulses that we can really, you know, control the the spectrum, the spectral shape of very, very accurately. And it, it might, it might be, you know, that fiber-based uh, lasers are, are more uh, appropriate for the kind of sort of pulse shapes and and repetition rates and things that we're looking at. Uh, so that it's un it's unclear whether indium phosphide would would be a solution for us in that space. So it's maybe not the answer you were hoping for, but... Well, it doesn't happen. matter, but uh, it would be good for road mapping, also for technology, that uh, these kind of requirements, if they become public one uh, in the future, because maybe you're not going to share the details here, uh, that would be great for technology development, for enabling technology development. Yeah. But yeah, but I, it's a, as I say, it's an, it's that, that, that part of it is an area that we're still like, exploring uh, in terms of it's particularly how you start to scale that up. So I think potentially some of the integrated platforms could give the sorts of densities that may be needed uh, to help with the scaling up challenges there. Thank you very much. And congratulations, Thanks. Martin, for in the entire JPX Pilot line, what you're doing, bringing Indian Phosphite, not only for Data Telecom, but all the different applications enabled. Martin put a link in the chat, which I will copy in YouTube, with all the different services offered by the JPX Pilot line. Mark. You know, you made me proud of being Bristolian. I really <laughs> can't wait to meet you and to have a find with you. It was really fascinating. Likewise. Please stay around if you can, because I would like you to also ask and contribute to the next presentations. If you have to go, I will understand, but please stay. It was fantastic to have you with us. You made, you made my day. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thanks a lot. Much appreciated. <laughs> So today we wanted to compare photonics with superconductors with diamond. It was the day for that. So we go from psi quantum to the qubits based on diamond from quantum brilliance. This is the kind of meeting that we have today. Thank you so much, quantum brilliance, to be represented in the room today by Jana Lechner. Jana, diamonds are beautiful and great on qubits. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. So first, I have to ensure that I'm unmuted. Usually, I forget this in such calls. And second, I'm going to share my screen that you can see my presentation. Um, it's coming. Yeah. Um, I can you see my screen. Gorilla Glass Clear. The floor is yours. Great, great, uh, wonderful. So I'm Jana Lehner. I'm the uh, chief of staff of Quantum Brilliance. I have a background in physics, uh, quantum optics, several years ago. Um, at that time, uh, I remember quantum computing was really a hot topic already. Also, it was really still a bit of science fiction. So being here today talking about real quantum computing, that's a great pleasure to me. So it's, it's, it's just a proof that science fiction can become true. 
So let's talk about quantum brilliance, so who we are and why we say quantum accelerator is a new tra trajectory for quantum computing. So uh, we are an Australian German startup um, founded in 2019 with the goal to build room temperature diamond quantum computers. Uh, we run the full stack approach. That means uh, we are not just uh, taking care on the, the, the qubits, but uh, also how the qubits are get integrated into a full system so that you can end up with a, with a complete quantum computer. Um, that's not only the device, but also the software. Here we partner with, for instance, for the Pauzi uh, Supercomputer Center in, in Austra uh, Australia uh, to test the integration, but also with respect to future application, we uh, partner with uh, machine learning company and applications companies. Currently, we are just ramping up our teams in Germany to uh, to, to have more, more uh, to have a uh, um, to, sorry. Uh, uh, so we, we just want to come come uh, building uh, building also manufacturing uh, quantum computers. Uh, oops. When you think about quantum computing, uh, why do we need quantum computers? This is always the big questions. Why they are so much better? We have so high high performance computer system. We heard in the previous talk, of course, there are challenging problems uh, that cannot be solved on the current computer systems. Uh, either the, the the problem is too complex, or the um, the the processing time would uh, would be too long. So here, the, the first idea when talking about quantum computing is thinking about systems that can outperform these high, uh, high performance supercomputers uh, because they can solve even more challenging problems. So this is the approach that uh, companies like, for instance, Google, IBM run, building uh, huge uh, systems with many qubits in order to, to solve all these challenging problems. However, uh, there is another path one could uh, think of. So what if we do not want to compete with a supercomputer, but just with a single uh, CPU that is an uh, element of so many computers we have today? So uh, the question is how much, how many qubits we need in order to outperform for a specific task, uh, a standard uh, uh, um, CPU or GPU that is a, a part of our current computers. So, and here uh, it turns out that uh, we need less, uh, less number of qubits in order to achieve uh, uh, some advantage uh, for specific problems, of course. And here, this is the path that quantum brilliance is going. So we do not want to compete with the supercomputers, but just with the individual CPUs, so that we here have um, advantage on, on tasks. And here, when we limit on this uh, type of application, we, we are able to, um, to, to build smaller uh, computers, so we do not need these huge um, devices. So, the goal is really have comparable size, weight, and power of a quantum de device, so a quantum, so to say, a quantum processor that uh, compares uh, and outperforms the classical one. And here uh, we, we we may reach then um, the quantum advantage uh, with our systems. With that approach, we oops. Um, we get a new, complete new area of application. So of course, uh, when we build uh, the, the uh, QPU such that we can add it uh, as part as additional element of the HPC system, then of course uh, we can enhance also these kind of, of supercomputers. However, as the, uh, the systems uh, we, we want to build are small, then they can be also used in distributed computing and medical devices or in autonomous um, application like car or even satellites. So there's still a way to go to, to shrink it to a size that uh, it fits into these applications. But the fundamental idea is really to have a, have a, quantum, uh, a quantum system, a quantum computer. Well, we call them accelerator because they accelerate the, the sol uh, solving a problem. Uh, it, together with maybe classical system or um, just um, yeah, but usually uh, in, in combination with some classical com uh, compu computers. So how does it work? Um, 
talked about um, diamonds. So the heart really of um, our um, uh, of our computer is is, is a diamond. Um, a diamond with that has NV centers. That means uh, there are defects in the diamond crystal. Uh, these defects are filled then. Um, it, where there is a carbon um, carbon atom replaced with a nitrogen and an adjacent uh, vacancy, and um, and this creates a very special structure in the diamond. Um, we use the nuclear spins of the nitro nitrogen and uh, also of the adjacent uh, carbon atoms as a qubit, and this electronic structure of this vacancy. Uh, this then used it couples to to the to the nuclear uh, nuclear spins and. Uh, Via this coupling, coupling, we can address the, the nuclear spins and so address our qubits, initialize, uh, manipulate, and so on. And also via this, this, uh, this uh, electronic spin, we, we do the readout. Um, I'll have here maybe the bar from the photo. So, so this is just one element uh, in, in, the, in the system. When we want to have a larger number of qubits, then of course we have to have an array of these NV centers built into the diamond crystal. Um, this diamond crystal is really the heart of, of the quantum computer. And of course we need a, a, a electronic a magnetic field and also optical system to address the qubits, read out uh, and perform all the activities. This is, is built around the crystal. Then the crystal with all the, um, the, the uh, additional subsystems for control are put into the box. And the box is then, well, this is a large one, <laughs> it's a, but the, the boxes are actually a bit smaller. But everything is then put into the box. Uh, it has all the interfaces so that it can be used as one of the elements in, in, in a computer rack, for instance. Um, currently, uh, we are... Um, uh, having um, our quantum development kit, uh, it's a 19 inch uh, rack size. Um, we, the, one of the main focus is really uh, also have this integration of uh, all the com components tested. So uh, it's not only having the, 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 the crystal, the diamond, uh, but everything needs to work together to have at, at the end really a, a useful product. So um, this is one of our uh, current activities, uh, having these, these um, having the system and and integrated. Uh, over the next years, of course, uh, we want to and in, in, um, increase the number of qubits on one hand. On the other hand, we want to shrink the size so that we come down to really a card-like uh, format. Um, and in addition, uh, also, we want to make these devices more robust so that they really can be part of, uh, uh, of, of on-the-edge applications that do not need maintenance, that do not need uh, huge uh, equipment, but uh, operating very stable and independently. Um, together with the with the hardware, we have um, a high performance emulator that um, also has a mapping um, the, the under, that contains the underlying model of the of the diamond crystal. So with that, we are able to to test to build already applications uh, that we then later on can transfer to the real devices. Uh, so. Uh, we believe that's very important to have on one hand the hardware, but on the other hand also the application. What are our next steps? Um, the, of course, uh, as I said, we want to um, increase the number of qubits. With that, of course, the entire uh, control system needs to be adapted to handle all the queries. But uh, on the other hand, a device is useful only if we have application it is it can be used for and here we are also seeking um, applications where such a different type of quantum computer can be used and has uh, and creates benefit for the customers thank you thank you very much jana for a great presentation i would like to first of all let you know that I am a huge fan of Quantum Brilliance. You know, you have to compare 
superconductors, ion, uh, diamond and photonics, ion photonics. I'm not going to lie to you. But what you are doing is simply fascinating. I think there are some questions in the room, but before I have to ask you the epic question. There are 756 companies behind me. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? Yeah, that's a very good question and always a very important question because, well, the quantum technology is very complex. You cannot do everything alone. So, and even if you try to build small devices, there's a lot of complexity behind. So, one of the uh, the challenging um, um, the challenges is really the diamond. So, we need very very uh, very pure diamonds uh, so that they are not disturbed by anything else. And we want to have our qubits, the master of the diamond, and not any any impurity. So, one is the diamond really that's important. Uh, another challenge we are facing, of course, placing the uh, the, the qubits and uh, uh, the NV centers to the diamond. Here, we think we have a solution, but uh, scaling is always a problem. Uh, and, and, and the challenge. So it's not only true for the huge computers, but also even for the smaller ones. So scaling is, is, is very, very important. And then uh, the integration of the entire system is, is something that uh, we pay a lot of attention uh, to, to produce this, um, this, this um, to, to, to come to a really a good uh, and, and useful device. But what, what is really um, then something where we, we also uh, would like to engage with others is what can we do then finally with this device? We, we are not able to solve the biggest problem of the world like the, the huge supercomputers, but we see a lot of potential on uh, where these, uh, our, our types of quantum computer can be utilized. Okay, that's great, Hannah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the answer. Um, I would like to ask something more. You mentioned in your presentation that there are some optical systems necessarily for the readout of, uh, of, uh, of your qubits. Could you please elaborate uh, a little bit more on that? Maybe that uh, triggers some uh, more questions from our audience. Uh, that's a very good question. Um... Yeah, we used the, the laser system for the readout, uh, but to be honest, um, um, how, how shall I say? Um, um, I would like to give the, the, uh, the question back. So um, the interesting part for you probably is then what type uh, made helpful, uh, what type of laser might, might, might be helpful to us or what is what is more the background uh, of the question? Is it more have, having some, yes, yes. Some, some, some understanding or? Yes, yes, please elaborate on that. Uh, just uh, yeah. tell, uh, let us know uh, which uh, type of laser is more useful for you. Um, yeah. Then, then I, to be honest, then I have to say I cannot answer this question. Okay. Uh, so I'm not involved in all these technical details. Uh, so uh, if there are some some very uh, some interest, then I would like to really would like to take the question uh, back to uh, back to uh, back home and and then come back if this is possible. This is great, Diana. It's great. There's no problem at all. There is one more question from uh, Jason. Uh, Jason, you would like to uh, to ask the question yourself. Actually, Anna, I think you just answered uh, the question for me about the placement of the NV centers. So these right now are randomly located and you choose a good set, but you are working towards um, positioning these deterministically? Yeah, that's exactly true. So the, the beginning is, of course, always, and I think this is a standard technology uh, for NV centers for not only for quantum computing, but also for, for other types for sensing or so, just placing the NV center somewhere and uh, and then find the best one that is fitting for the purpose. But in order to build quantum computers, you have to have certain uh, requirements. So the NV centers uh, cannot be so, so far apart. They have to have a certain orientation so this, in order to have an efficient uh, control uh, about the system, you have to place them in, 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 a, in a very, very precise uh, way. And uh, yeah, we are working on, on exactly this, um, this uh, precise placement of the NV center. And uh, we, we, we think we have, a, we, we have a solution for that. And that needs to be worked out now. Thank you, Jan. I appreciate it.
Jaina Jaina how great it is to to speak just before Psy Quantum and just before the ions of of uh, Ion Q. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason, for being with us today. Uh, I would like to ask Jana now. So when we have uh, your your technology, I can share the slide again here. Uh, how does the supply chain look like? Is it for you? Are there challenges to obtain the diamond chips and to process the microwave control on top? Can you please repeat? Yes, for the <laughs> supply chain, how, yeah. uh, how does it look? Uh, is it difficult? Is it to obtain the diamond? Oh, yeah, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll have to, sorry, I had a complete different focus. So I, I'm now understanding what you're saying. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we need the diamonds, diamonds, and we need them in a very high, uh, um, high, high, uh, very, then we need very clean diamonds, and this is one element in the supply chain that is really important to, to get these diamonds. Uh, for the manufacturing of the, the next steps, so building in the NV centers and doing all these, these con adding the control elements, here this, this is a is, 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 is not that critical, but the diamonds is really the heart of everything. And this is the absolute uh, uh, the, the requirement that we get enough diamonds. For now, we are in the more research state, but we are also working on um, going, uh, going into a more productive uh, production line motors. And with that, then of course, the requirement to get a huge number of diamonds uh, is, is really a strong one. So, uh, a provider of diamonds that might be the future. Perhaps we, we can help actually in a previous meeting, in the previous quantum meeting, Bosch, Robert Bosch joined the joined the meeting. Janine Diedrich Muller was talking about their quantum sensors based on diamond. We asked the same question. When two companies share the same challenge, there's always room for cooperation. We'll introduce you offline. But coming all the way from the European Defense Agency, Epic has very good relationship with them. Patrick Langlois. Thank you very much, Patrick, for joining the meeting today. Tell us, what's on your mind? Patrick Langlois from the European Defense Agency, EDA. I'm going to read the question because we may have a sound problem. Uh, Patrick wonders, uh, Jana, you mentioned a uh, one millisecond coherence time. How do you position this compared to other, techni other technologies and how do you see the evolution? So, very good question. Um, it's somehow, um, in a way, uh, difficult to compare the different technologies. Um, what I think for each technology, it's important uh, because the, uh, there's so many differences in all the approaches we have in quantum computation. When you look at, at this, uh, this, this, um, this, this superconducting um, qubits versus the diamonds, for instance, and also the ion trap. This is a complete different approach. And what counts really is not really comparing the, 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 the gates uh, and the, 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 the time um, and the coherence time, but uh, just as a total number between the devices and the different approaches. But uh, for, the, each, um, for each approach, for each technology, it must be such that you can really perform uh, gate operations and computations. So if you can have a very short uh, coherence time, but for your system, it's pretty meaningless, but it applies, uh, it, it, it turns out it's a very good uh, coherence time for other systems. So I would hesitate to say, uh, well, this is a good one or not. So for us, uh, it's, it's good enough to perform. Um, gate operations and computations, so we are fine. Of course, there is room for improvement. One to, to 10 microseconds gate time, <laughs> coherence time of more than one millisecond. Jana, what you're doing is truly amazing. Amazing, be very proud. I am very proud of having quantum brilliance at the meeting today, Jenna, thank you very much. We started with photonics, then we went to diamond. I'm a huge fan of the next company. Panagiotis uh, and me, we are extremely happy with the companies coming today. Ion Q, Jason Amini, thank you very much for taking the role for being the next speaker today. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to you. Use it wisely. Thank you, Jose. Appreciate it. I'm going to have to match uh, your energy a bit here to get through all these slides. Uh, let me start sharing and we will we'll get moving. All right. Can you see me? Oh, see my slides? Okay. Yes. Do Control L. They got it. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So as I said, um, my name is Jason Meany. I'm a senior physicist here at INQ. 
And uh, I'm going to be giving uh, this very, very quick overview of our systems, um, look at uh, some recent results, and then focus on how we plan on scaling our systems. Since this is an epic talk, I will zoom in on the photonics portion of that scaling plan. Now, a little bit of background here. Uh, we were founded in 2015 by two leaders of the field, uh, Jung Sang Kim and Chris Monroe, uh, and we quickly became a leader in quantum computing by building a full stack experience, starting from building the quantum systems themselves all the way up through uh, cloud access. Now, our qubits here are atoms, simply that. Each is identical, no fabrication variation, qubit lifetimes are in the seconds, and that is really not the limit for us. When an electron is stripped off the atom, we get an ion that be, can be physically confined in our fall trap. And so my question to uh, Yena was, my job is placing those ions where they need to be. Uh, we form chains here, as you can see, of these ions in these, uh, in these RF pole traps. And we don't need something like a dilution fridge uh, as the trap actually suspends the ions above the surface of the trap, decoupling it from the thermal environment. Now in quantum computing, there's a, this dichotomy. Uh, we need non-interacting qubits for long memory times, uh, but we need highly interacting qubits for fast gates. Ions allow us to bridge this dichotomy. We can transfer the long-lived atomic states into a highly interacting motional state and vice versa using lasers. Uh, by switching which ions are being hit by those lasers, uh, we can uh, generate a gate between any pair of ions in that chain. This is full connectivity across the chain. And we can grow this chain as we need in a single device and expand from few ions to many ions without changing anything except some voltages. So. How does IonQ compare to uh, available systems right now? I'm just happy to say we compare exceedingly well. Uh, in a recent paper by the QEDC, our newest system here on the left beat out our competitors in both qubit number and in useful circuit depth. Uh, here you see a BV algorithm for 21 qubits. Uh, and here we have a circuit depth of 512 gates and still keep uh, mid-range output fidelity. And you can compare to the results from IBM, Honeywell, and Rigetti. Now, the prior benchmarks are simply that. They are benchmarks. So what can you actually do with a quantum computer? Uh, we still have ways to go before we get to the idealized uh, error-corrected system, as we heard from earlier. Uh, but one of the promising areas for NISC-level quantum computers and distribution sampling. Uh, here, we have a generative adversarial network uh, running on a trading data set from financial markets. Uh, the classical system running around 20,000 iterations still leaves much to be desired. If we replace the generator with a quantum circuit with tunable phases, uh, in a thousand iterations, we start seeing it look like we expect. Uh, if we then replace the, um, the detector with um, a KL divergence, um, we can actually then iterate in 26 iterations and get the desired distribution. Uh, for an inter overview of uh, some other results, uh, go to YouTube and watch INQ, uh, INQ Sonica uh, Jury's talk about quantum GANs and image uh, generation as well. Now, this conference is on scaling. So let's look at the INQ's path to scaling here. We're going small to go big. Unfortunately, I can't show you INQ systems themselves, uh, but I can show you representative technologies. Now in 2016, you can see here, uh, one of uh, Chris Monroe's labs and the scale of uh, a quantum, ion quantum computer with all the tables, all the optics. In 2018, this was reduced down to a two meter box, also at a UMD. Um, and this is the basis for our early uh, quantum computers. Uh, Jung Song at Duke is now uh, working on miniaturizing the delivery optics, miniaturizing the packages, and going to the heart of uh, Epic and the people on this call, yes, integrated photonics for delivery of light to our ions and collection of light and such. But moving forward, all this allows for smaller systems, increased qubit count and fidelity. But at this point, we scale by going back to big by interconnecting system level using photonic interconnects. We heard a little bit about the style of interconnect earlier, but this case, interconnecting our ion modules. So we interconnect the systems by triggering photon emission in our target qubits between two QPUs. One in each module gets interconnected. We then interfere with those uh, photons. If both photons make it through the detector, we have now entangled ions in both systems. Remember, the ions have, we can then use these ions to entangle the other ions that are connected within that system, creating full entanglement. 
Remember, ions have long memory states, so we can hold the quantum state while the photon interconnect is made. By plugging in multiple systems into a fiber switch, we can couple any two modules into a cluster. And here we have eight modules fully connected through the photonic path. And each module has full connectivity between its qubits. This merges all the QPUs into a single powerful system. Now, photonic interconnects right now are about the 50th the speed of qubit to qubit direct gates uh, within the chain. However, this qubit speed, this interconnect speed has been increasing rapidly. We will leverage photonics technology uh, to uh, help gain the, get push the speed up faster, integration, devices, cavities, et cetera, detectors, you know, single photon detectors we heard about earlier. All, uh, all the together allows to scale. And really want, if you want to scale, here's an example from uh, Jung San Kim when he was at Bell Labs, 1100 port uh, optical switch. You want big, there is big. So our roadmap has a steadily increase in the number of algorithm qubits over the next few years by extending the number of trapped ions and improving the gate quality. At the next stage, we get to leap forward with error correction and then integrating the module to module interconnects to the photonics. Remember, two systems linked through, uh, together don't just double the Hilbert space, they square it. So each module, you get a uh, power so going in uh, computational uh, complexity. Now, closing out, in October, INQ went public on the New York Stock Exchange. You can see how much of the company showed up for the event, and we are growing rapidly now. So pitch to everyone here. We are looking for talented researchers to join us on this adventure. Now, by the way, I think that's my sleeve way in the back here. You can just barely see it and here. Thank you for your time, and I'm open to questions. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thank you. That, uh, that's amazing. Uh, so do you have any questions for the, for the people? If not, I will go for one. I will do the same question again that I did to, uh, uh, to Yana before. Could you please elaborate a little bit more on the optical systems you are using, the lasers, what type of, uh, of lasers you are interested in and what are the certain characteristics? Um, in particular, the lasers, we're everywhere from the UV through the IR. So I can't give you specific wavelengths or even particular ranges. Unfortunately, uh, I know that makes it harder, but we're looking at, you know, we need to have lots of these. We need power, we need uh, types. So anything to do miniaturization, get higher power, co um, coherence matters. Um, we can use help with that. Integration, you know, this is photonics or region. We need to uh, talk with partners about photonics integration, technologies we might be able to apply. We have now the capabilities and the resources to expand and try different things. And so getting partners through uh, collaborations like can be on uh, this site and this talk, um, we can look into bringing that into our fold and working with uh, that and using it. Can't give the specifics, unfortunately, of those, but we are open to whatever will help us bring this uh, to the table. Okay, thank you. Thank you, but there is a question from uh, Orca Computing from uh, Richard. Richard, can you please ask this question yourself? Yeah, thanks very much. I'll speak in a minute about sort of all the work that Ork is doing on photonic quantum computing. I'm just curious about, um, by the way, really nice talk. Um, do, you, do you ever see a, a role for photonic logic in your, because obviously you, sh you show the diagram that just shows interconnects, and maybe I might be thinking a bit long term here, but um, have you guys thought very much about whether you might want to not do more with your photons than just provide the interconnect? So the basic interconnect is a very basic, you know, uh, logic gate um, heralded uh, for the entanglement. But I could imagine, yes, I've not particular myself thought about that, but I can imagine others are. But yeah, I actually, um, you could imagine taking these, putting it in, doing some offline, well, not offline, but through the photonic system, doing more entanglement, more complex uh, engagement of the ion qubits. And, you know, really all quantum computing is going to have to make these trade-offs between the benefits of one versus the other. And the more we can make that trade off and share, the better the whole system will be. So I would say uh, it's definitely out there. Um, right now, I don't know of a particular project to work on it, but uh, I'm absolutely certain we'll be thinking about it in the future. Cool, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Jason. And there is another question coming now from, from Martin from Zepix. Martin? Yeah, quick Martin? question. Yes, you hear me? Yes, please, please go. 
A Go quick ahead. question on uh, the, so you mentioned quite a lot of wavelengths that you might want to integrate. I saw you mentioned uh, in your slide an uh, MIT photonic integrated circuit. I assume that is silicon nitride. Um, we are exploring, I can't, again, fortunately, this no, is okay, nature, unfortunately not being is... in academia anymore. I no, do I have understand. to be careful. <laughs> no, well, I understand, but you were yeah. referring to MIT work there. That's why I asked uh, to the, uh, the Lincoln lab, the Lincoln labs. Uh, yes. Uh, Jeremy actually, who's one of the people on that now is leading this effort. Um, so we are, we will strong connections to academic academia and we love to leverage the technology developed. We were mostly here started as academics and understand that it, it's a great resource and having those collaborations. Um, so yeah, I think the examples, the image I showed was Lincoln MIT's results with their uh, chip, which is showed you can have the integrated uh, photonics and an ion trap uh, and put them together and deliver light access. And we want to take that and run with it and develop and expand. But I actually have a question more on the packaging of that uh, whole thing. So you mentioned a lot of lasers. Uh, so do you envision that you can still do that with uh, discrete packaging or do you need to go to something like... Uh, I mean, for example, I just put a link there. There's a collaboration between um, with iMac about uh, transfer printing. Would you think you need to go to a next level of, uh, let's say, assembly that you need transfers printing instead of discrete assembly? I don't know what transverse printing is, but any bit way that we can reduce the size and make multi modules fit closer in, all the better. So right now, external cavity laser diodes and those styles are relatively large. They're very stable. You know, we need ions do you want narrow line widths? If we can get that in a smaller package, get many more of them, get more and more power, more control, by all means. We now, as I said, we by going public, one of the reasons not just to go public is to be able to get the resources to explore all these possibilities and filter in those into our running systems and our systems and our general availability for users. Um, and get them going. We need to expand and read ideas and meet collaborators So and partners. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. This is great. Thanks a lot. So we do have any other questions? If not, maybe we can pass to the next speaker, uh, which is uh, Yelmer Renama from, uh, from uh, Netherlands, from Quicks. Right. Are you ready? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Hi. Thank welcome. you, Yelmer. Great. Hi, welcome. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jan Reema. I'm uh, the CTO of Quix Quantum, and I'm going to tell you something about uh, the photonic uh, quantum hardware solutions that we have realized. So our mission statement as Quix is to make the world's best quantum photonic hardware. And as I will show you in the next 10 minutes or so, uh, we have succeeded at this. We are a young company founded in January 2019. We currently have a headcount of 12. We're a spin out of the University of Twente located on their campus in the east of the Netherlands. Uh, we started with a local angel investor in 2019, obtained some seed funding in 2020 uh, and have since uh, essentially grown to be the market leader in photonic quantum hardware. So I think this slide will need no argument uh, in this audience. Photonics is one of the leading uh, I would say the leading architecture for quantum computing. Uh, it's one of two architectures that has succeeded in obtaining a quantum advantage. It's scalable, it's highly integrated with classical uh, photonics technology, and it can operate at room temperature, which are all key advantages. Uh, Quix is leading when it comes to quantum photonics technology. We have the largest lowest loss quantum photonic systems in the world. I will show you those in a minute. And something that we are also very proud of is that in a field that is filled with hype, we have succeeded in delivering all of our tech milestones so far. So we have promised what we done, what we said we would do. We're also, as I already mentioned, the market leader. We have sold four quantum photonic systems to academics uh, and startups, and we have collaborations running with some of the major universities. And you can find the press releases uh, on our website. So what is then the system that we are talking about? We are talking about a quantum photonic processor, which is our brand name for a large scale, fully tunable linear interferometer. Uh, such a device sits at the heart of a NISC photonic quantum computer. So you can see the picture here with the interferometer uh, outlined in red. So the components that you would need for this are 
well, I mean, they have all already been mentioned in this meeting, photon sources, interferometers, and detectors. Um, our expertise, as I mentioned, is on the interferometer, but we also sell uh, the complete system, right? So we sell NISC photonic quantum computers. Regarding the interferometer, um, as I mentioned, uh, our tech is leading at this point. We have built a 12 Q mode uh, interferometer, which is the largest interferometer in the world with record low losses, 2.5 dB fiber to fiber uh, and a fidelity of 99%. And this system, uh, fidelity for the optical transformation of 99%. Uh, this system comes fully packaged, uh, plug and play, benchtop, ready to go. Uh, fiber ports at the front, a USB cable at the back, you plug it in, you type in the optical transformation with, that you want to do, and the system knows all the details about this chip and just does it for you. Um, so since this is a meeting about scalability, I just wanted to put this out there. Um, if you compute the number of optical components that you can go through before you lose a significant fraction of your light, then it turns out that silicon nitride is the only technology that is capable of scaling to useful system sizes, right? So a lot of our success uh, relies on the underlying technology, which is the triplex waveguide platform, um, where we can obtain uh, both record fiber to chip coupling losses uh, of about 0.5 dB per facet, and also uh, record propagation losses uh, of about one uh, of about zero less than 0.1 dB per centimeter. Although it actually turns out that that number is not the key number. What you care about is you care about losses per component. And if you calculate it like that, uh, so how many components can you put on a chip before you lose the light, then you get the results in this figure. And that shows really that silicon nitride uh, is truly leading. Then a few teasers for the future. So we have delivered this 12 Q mode system. Uh, in, uh, sorry, this should read quarter one, 2022, of course, uh, there will be an announcement of a 20 Q mode system. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, be there when we make this announcement, sign up for our newsletter on the quicks.nl website. Uh, and then finally, uh, people were mentioning wafer sized photonic circuits earlier uh, and how this is a challenge. And I just wanted to put this picture out there and I will not say anything more about this. So we believe, preemptively answering the epic question, we believe in quantum computing as um, something that is very much still transitioning from academia to industry. So we believe in an open access model. So answering the epic question, what we are looking for is we are looking for quantum software partners and we are looking for experts on electronic packaging with a very large number of components. Uh, so let's say 2,000 connections or more. And what we are offering, I want to highlight two things here. First of all, we are offering NISC photonic quantum computing as a product, right? So you can buy this from us today. But secondly, um, we have expertise on steering light through many channels with high fidelity. And we think that this can very well be useful in other quantum computing technologies that rely on light for the actuation of the qubits. So whether that's ion traps, cold atom systems, uh, uh, diamond-based systems, but even systems that are not quantum computers. So think, for example, of atomic clocks for um, optical positioning systems. Um, an advantage there is that silicon nitride is very, very broadband. So of course, diamond uh, emits at the wavelength where silicon uh, is simply not transparent, so not very useful. And I just want to put out here uh, this picture, which is from a collaboration of our colleagues at Lyonix, uh, together with the University of Zurich, who actually realized um, an, integrated, uh, in an integrated actuation system uh, for an ion trap. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. You wish you could conclude now, Jelmer. Now is the most important part of the meeting, but first of all, First of all, you guys are moving fast. Oh my God. So the chip is already packaged. Uh, and can you actually ship this as a demonstrator to other people who could try something on it? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we have, I think by now, something like five of these systems out in the world uh, at various uh, universities and companies. 
and so far the feedback that we have gotten back is uh, is just entirely positive so everyone is very happy with the software that is around this um, with the usability of the system so these are just these are really bench top um, plug and play photonic processors that have been market validated I am really impressed, but I want people to be as impressed as I am. So I'm going to call out for the people from Terra Quantum in the room. Anybody from Terra Quantum in the room? Please unmute yourself. Yes, we are. Yes. So you, you see what I am what I am showing here. I am I am very very. I'm going to stop sharing his screen to share mine. I oh, am sure. impressed to what they're doing. And um, they have this as a demonstrator to apply in different environments. For me, this is a clear room for cooperation. How do you envision, how, how can you, look, I'm going to go to NSGD, I'm going to put this in my car, I'm going to drive to you. How can you use this? That's interesting because the system that we've actually set up, we can connect any QPU to the cloud. And when we go into this deeper, we're going to show you how we do that. But uh, in terms of kind of our strategy, it's like, how do we create the system where uh, we can not only integrate two uh, simulated QPUs, but also native QPUs that are not just us, but also those of our ecosystem. And so we're looking for um, other QPU players who are interested in offering their QPU through the cloud, uh, through our customers who are looking for, you know, hybrid quantum advantage on an application level. And so I think that could be highly interesting to explore in terms of uh, putting our node uh, close to your QPU to make it accessible by cloud. So I think that's one interesting idea. For me, it is obvious that the two you need to work together. So after this meeting, you don't start working together, I quit. So then you can all, up, all ask me for what I want to do next. The next question in the room comes from the city of Quantum. I'm good friend of Epic from today, Mark Thompson. Mark, what's on your mind? Yeah, so if I understand correctly, the, the system uh, enables qubit uh, or, or Q mode reconfigurability uh, and manipulation. I'd like to know a little bit more about what's the source, you know, what's the photon source, what's the, the photon detection that happens within that system, and uh, maybe a little bit about you know, the speed of the reconfigurability that's possible. Well, so the great thing about this system is that it's completely agnostic to the photon sources and the detectors that you want to attach to it, right? So the vision here is that this can really operate at any wavelength, uh, let's say between 400 nanometers and um, something like 3000 nanometers. So we are completely, uh, we're not dependent on who is going to win the photon source race, essentially, right? Because I think it's still um, very much open uh, sort of whether it's going to be parametric gun conversion or quantum dots or perhaps even uh, more exotic photon sources. And we are one of the few players who can actually um, operate on all of these devices in a completely agnostic manner. And the same is true for the detectors. Okay, yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, can you say a little bit about the speed of the reconfigurability of the system? Uh, so at the moment, we do this with thermal actuation, um, but uh, this is obviously something that could be improved. Okay, thank you. So when you, when I see this chip, uh, Jelmer, I, I, I am very impressed with the fact that you went that far. But of course, the, the, the packaging, I understand, is still a challenge. Are you, do you still have challenges regarding how much uh, how much losses we can have from the fiber to the chip or is the 2.5 dB still uh, it's okay it's enough for you well I mean of course and I want to stress this is a world leading number right so um, of course at the same time lower is always better I think the real challenge uh, that we're facing at the moment is how to scale this up in terms of electrical interconnects, right? So something that we are very much interested in is um, finding solutions for, let's say, wafer level uh, electrical and optical packaging. I am 
extremely, Yelmer, extremely impressed what you're doing, coming all the way from Enschede, looking for partners. Cooperation through innovation has been the secret of all the, all the companies from the Pantera Group. Quix Quantum is doing a fantastic job. Thank you, well, Yelmer. Thank you so much. Why don't we continue with this great meeting with another company in the field of quantum computing? I just quickly made all of you know about Terra Quantum, because for me, it's the system integrator that is the glue in this community. Thank you very much, the Director of Strategy, Vishal Shet, for being with us today. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Terra Quantum. Bring us all together. Let us solve problems together. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, great to be here. Uh, such a pleasure to be here and great to meet all of you. Um, I am the Director of Strategy, as, as you just mentioned. Alongside me here is Karen Pinto as well. Um, great. So what we'll take you guys through is a little bit about us and then a little bit about what we're doing uh, and just really, um, you know, a view on the epic question as well in terms of how we could all uh, work together and collaborate going forward. Um, great. Karen, do you want to uh, just say hi? Yeah, I've been already speaking, so you know who I am now. So, yeah. Great. Great. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, our vision as a firm, uh, our vision is really to create exponential impact through the full spectrum of quantum technologies uh, for the benefit of business and society. Um, and we do this through implementing our philosophy, which is really we do whatever is possible to help drive commercial advantage today for our clients. Uh, and we do this in a way such that our clients don't really need to take a bet on which hardware architecture that, uh, that's going to win out and allows them to uh, create large-scale applications with us today. Um, uh, in terms of the team, we're, uh, we're very fortunate to have a sort of a very, very sort of uh, well-established lead leadership team, both in terms of scientific credibility as well as industrial presence. Um, so we've got some great leaders here from, you know, from, from uh, all across the world. Uh, we are a Swiss headquartered company with about 100 people based in six countries around the world, around North America and in Europe. Uh, and what we do is, is really bring together the nexus of scientific advancement and industrial need. Um, and we do this through three business lines, really. Uh, quantum algorithms as a service, quantum compute as a service, and quantum safety as a service. Um, on the algorithms and application side, what we do is develop, uh, as it says, algorithms and, and applications to solve real world problems. And, and we do this in a way that harnesses the best available technology that's, that's, that exists. Uh, this could be in our own compute cloud as well, and as well as other, um, other QPUs or other processes from within the ecosystem. Um, today's uh, session will be very much focused on our quantum compute uh, with, through our QMY cloud. And uh, in the future, perhaps we can talk about quantum safety, uh, which is a suite of, suite of solutions to help protect uh, clients against uh, the threat of quantum computing going forward. Uh, so today we've got key differentiators which make each of these three each of these three business uh, units pretty unique. Uh, but when you look at quantum compute uh, in particular, we've got our QMware cloud, uh, which is uh, we'll, we'll be we'll be talking a fair bit about, which you know really shows the unique uh, capability of it, the in-memory architecture that is that exists over there. Uh, but in addition to that, we also have native quantum processing devices that are in development, uh, which uh, we can't talk too much about today, uh, but they, you know, hopefully in, in, in future meetings, we can uh, provide more color on. Uh, but, but in addition to that, we've got unique capabilities across the other pillars as well around how we address optimization and, and machine learning problems, etc. Um, so bringing that together, what we do really is develop uh, hybrid algorithms, which plug into end user applications, uh, which utilize, which often run on our QMware, QMware cloud. Um, our hybrid quantum cloud from, from QMware is powered by the best of supercomputers, uh, simulated quantum processing units, our own quantum computing hardware, which uh, we're, we're developing, as well as uh, native quantum processors from, from across the e ecosystem. Um, now, what's unique here is we have this um, unified memory architecture, which allows all of these different processes to come together in terms of one unified memory structure, uh, which really um, enhances performance much beyond what would be possible when, it, when approaching each of these processes on an individual basis. Um, Using this capability, really, we're allowed, we're able to solve large scale problems for our clients. And often what we do is create what we call business advantage, which is uh, in the way we solve these problems, they're better 
and what clients are doing with their own technologies today. Um, so I'll, I'll let Karen take, uh, take it further in terms of uh, specifically what we do with QMware. Yeah, and so our pursuit has really been how can we find highly valuable intersections between challenges that are faced across industries and the quantum technology where we have leading IP. And where this pursuit has actually led us is to think about a couple of very practical things. One is that on an application perspective, our customers really do not care what the underlying hardware and software is driving the advantage. So we want to make sure that we have the greatest amount of advantage from the best available in both, not just the quantum world, but also the classical world. Second, we realize that it's very important for efficient synchronization between the quantum and classical information storage and processing elements in order to create new hybrid quantum capabilities. And so with this in mind, we've brought together a multi-processing environment that facilitates this. Before we dive deeper into the specific architecture, we've already uh, showcased the performance of this for some well-known benchmark problems in uh, industry. For example, on the left-hand side, in the optimization space, if we look at the max cut problem, which is a 256 node, a fully connected weighted graph, here we've compared our quantum encoding method, uh, which is hardware and software optimized uh, against the best in class classical technique, not just a, a quantum or quantum inspired technique like say QAOA. And there you can see superior results to uh, CPLEX, which is a well-known solver out there. But we've done this across different problem types as well uh, with a focus on you know, eliminating bias as far as possible and being driven by the advantage, uh, which has been powered by our simulated QPUs where we have 40, um, uh, 40 logical qubits today. Next, if we look a bit deeper into We may have some connectivity problems, Karan. We lost yeah. sound for one second. You there, Karan? Yeah, I'm there. Can you yes, me? all right. Yeah. If you move to the next slide, yeah. So, yeah, so just giving you a bit of a, you know, a view of what makes our architecture really unique, right? So we enable multi-processing. This is fundamentally different from co-processing as in we enable you to solve problems with the same central memory. And this lets us house not only quantum processing units, but a plethora of other processing units that we have in development and also have some of them today. And the unique ability of us being able to make this synchronization accessible by cloud and available to hybrid quantum algorithms out there on a hardware agnostic basis is what makes us from a, you know, gives us a very unique positioning in the ecosystem from a, you know, you could call it an integrator or a practical kind of advantage perspective. And just some, uh, a little bit of uh, color on a bit of our roadmap. So if we move to the next one there, uh, our roadmap is very much built. Firstly, today, we only have our simulated QPUs because our native quantum processes are still under development as not as performant. Uh, and we still run on other QPU systems out there uh, to test performance and, uh, and look at whether it can beat the performance we get with simulated QPUs today. But as we progress into 2023, 2024, we'll be also having virtualized CPUs and GPUs as well uh, with gradual increase in the number of simulated qubits. But as you know, that is limited to a certain extent, but then we see coming into play our own native QPUs, as well as more logical qubits available through whichever architecture wins in the, in the ecosystem. And so we're not really betting on a particular qubit type, but we're creating a system which can facilitate connection uh, from an application level uh, for customers to where the advantage would potentially be 
the greatest and there are a lot of challenges in terms of you know how we can how we're making this happen and so collaboration is something that we're very much looking for so that brings me to kind of what we can offer and 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 the ask so in terms of what we can offer um we very much want to uh, collaborate with other uh, native quantum processing unit companies out there uh, like sci quantum and such uh, where we can discuss how uh, we can integrate and provide a node uh, in our in memory architecture to the cloud where we are already building hybrid hardware agnostic quantum applications that's the first thing which we can offer and in terms of um, uh, a request it's more you know we're very open to discussing uh, further collaboration on a different fronts uh, if any of the other pillars are also interesting whether that's algorithms compute or, or safety Vishal, anything else to add? No, that's great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So you, you, you're done, no? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Uh, very interesting. Uh, really difficult to understand everything, uh, but really, really interesting. We have already a question from Ana Gonzalez from Ipronix. Ana? Hey, thank you very much, uh, Panagotis. Well, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. Yes, I would like just to, to tell you what the Ipronix is doing. So we are developing a, a hardware for, I mean, regarding programmable photonics. So in this case, what we have is a mesh of Mac tenders where we can tune every Mac tender individually. Um, we can tune the phase, we can tune the amplitude. So it's a very flexible um, platform. Then we can add the other uh, building blocks. So it's like we can do whatever you want. Um, you, you want to do. And we are now, we have now a beta testing program. Uh, in this case, we, we are working with some companies to develop uh, what they are interested in I and mean, the application in which they are interested. So if you want, we could talk uh, further about, uh, about your application and if we can help you uh, with, your, with your project. For sure, Anna, it would be great to, to talk further. Look forward to it. Okay, I will contact you through Jose, through Panagotis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anna. Thanks a lot. And uh, one more question to both of you, Vaisal and Karan. So what, uh, what the, the, the epic question, what others can do for you and what you can do for others? <clears throat> so really, um, as, as we said, right, like, so we're developing a platform which can be powered by various processing units uh, where you don't have to change your application um, but where the, as the processing in units that power it start to evolve. So uh, really what we'd like to do with the community is uh, those are, that are developing processing units. Uh, if you want to, if you see this as an interesting um, proposition, you can come and integrate with our cloud. Um, and that's really the, uh, you know, the, the most, uh, I guess, um, prominent uh, request for, for, the community. So yeah, we'd love to um, speak with others that uh, feel that this is this would be interesting. And maybe just to add on in terms of what we can offer, like a large focus of ours is to you know humanize quantum and improve the accessibility of it. So in that pursuit across the entire stack, uh, which we haven't shown here, but we can go in depth to people who are looking to partner. We've developed our own quantum SDK called Basic. We've got a lot of work that we've done on the middle layer and as well as on the lower level as well. So I think we've got a lot to offer from the entire stack perspective, which helps accelerate or facilitate this system integration uh, where you can make your QPU accessible via the cloud in a shared memory environment so that you don't lose any of the performance gains of uh, moving or just connecting to it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Karan. But uh, it seems uh, already that uh, Yelmer is interesting. Mr. Putin, you would like to comment something, Yelmer, here? And of course, we can connect you further later. Yelmer? Okay, that's okay. We can, uh, we can always have the connection later. We can, uh, we can introduce you later on. Uh, so if there is no other question, we can pass to the next speaker. Uh, Benjamin Lilian Uhlik from uh, Fraunhofer IPM. PMS, uh, Benjamin? Yes, I'm here. Are you ready? Perfect. I am ready. So let me share my screen. Here we go. And full screen. 
So, okay. You, you see the screen? Yeah, I can see everything perfect. Great. So um, thank you for the invitation. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as I'm not from a company, but from a research organization, I, uh, I'm a little bit the, the alien in the workshop here today. So my name is Benjamin. I'm from Fraunhofer IPMS. Fraunhofer, as you may know, is the largest research organization in Europe. And um, the IPMS stands for um, Institute for Photonic Microsystems. So where we are, we are in the heart of Silicon Saxony. Um, we are in Dresden. And uh, we have two locations. So um, one 200 millimeter clean room um, focusing on MEMS technologies and one 300 millimeter clean room focusing on, on really advanced CMOS technologies. And in the, in the yeah, close vicinity, there's uh, Bosch, Infineon, Global Foundries, always there's 300 millimeter fabs. So um, as you see, our core competency, our infrastructure and our knowledge really lies uh, into microelectronics and the semiconductor fabrication. So that's why the um, topic of my talk is also microelectronics enabling large scale uh, quantum computing. Um, as a motivation, maybe I don't have to talk too much about this because uh, Mark already covered a lot of this in his uh, initial talk. So um, the, the, the main message is that a modern semiconductor fabrication technology uh, might be needed for, for large scale quantum computing. Um, the, the main reason is, of course, the number of qubits. You probably need millions to really do complex um, algorithms. And um, since qubits are really prone to errors uh, for error cor correction, you need even more qubits. So uh, that's uh, always the, the main argument, but um, that's not the only one. Um, with, with the um, established semiconductor processes, we, you have all the tools like variability control, process control, yield control which uh, may ultimately lead to, to, to better qubits, better coherence time and, and gate fidelity. Also, there's the problem of, of interconnect or called wiring apocalypse. So uh, of course you can um, couple your qubits discreetly, um, but um, if this extends the, the thousands of qubits, you really have to, to think about integrated solutions. And, and that's also where the traditional um, CMOS technology um, already has um, answers uh, prepared. Um, anyway, you need the interface to classical electronics. So you, you have the, the, the match to, to the CMOS. Um, anyway, you need the, the control electronics. You, you might benefit from the, from the advanced packaging and so on. And uh, another good thing is uh, that um, the, the technology of the, the microelectronics are not just applicable to, to, to one qubit platform, but to a lot of them. And, and later in the talk, I will try to show you a, a few examples um, where we think uh, we might find uh, useful applications for this. And um, last but not least, of course, we are not the only one um, who um, think like this. Um, as the qubit technologies become uh, more major, they will eventually move from the labs to the fabs. So uh, in the end, uh, there will be some kind of uh, wafer level processing. And uh, that's where we want to be ready already. So um, as I said, some examples um, where this semiconductor technology processes and, and the infrastructure might be helpful really for scalable quantum computing. Um, uh, below you see a picture of our 300 millimeter CMOS clean room, uh, which we originally used for the semiconductor players, but we really want to explore this new and exciting field of uh, quantum computing. So a few examples for a few various platforms. Um, the first obvious choice is really those qubits uh, which have a solid state background. So for example, superconducting or a quantum dot based qubits. So some examples, we, we use our um, high resolution E-beam, uh, for example, for um, high definition gate patterning to, to really um, form quantum dots and, and control quantum dot based qubits. So on, on the right, you see here some um, ready processes on, on, on a wafer level together with uh, some uh, German partners. We have the, the, the advanced uh, edge processes known for the microelectronics industry. Another um, example might be the, the tool on the lower right. It's, it's a really a sophisticated big uh, PVD cluster, which is originally used for MRAM applications for the semiconductor industry. And we want to, to co-use it basically to 
to, to look for new superconducting materials, which might be used in superconducting devices, or on the other hand, to, to really form integrated micromagnets with new, with new magnetic materials for um, gate-defined um, qubits. Of course, you have all the, the, the metrology, the physical failure, failure analysis and the electric characterization you, you know from the um, semiconductor industry. And we, we upgraded it really to, to cryo characterization and, um, and advanced cryo characterization down to the milli Kelvin uh, will, will follow in, in the next time so that we can really um, offer the whole package from, from the processing integration to the characterization for different qubit types coming from the solid state qubits, a um, uh, small um, excursion basically to, to, to silicon photonics. There's another project uh, starting where we together in a larger consortia um, want to develop an electro-optical co-integration platform where the goal is really to, to, to integrate um, certain PPUs um, by um, silicon nitride-based waveguides and, and polymer optical interconnects on an uh, interposer-based approach. And later, there might be the option to, to hetero integrate um, additional components like uh, laser diodes and so on. So um, possible applications for this might be um, more in the quantum cryptography world for, for random number generators or other um, security generation. But you could also think about really um, having a, a qubit processor based on photonic approaches as a PPU here. So this is also something we want to use our integration know-how from the uh, microelectronics world to, to put it into, into more uh, use. Um, another group of ours really deals then with the control of such things. So the, the task here was to really um, do an analog control of an array of phase modulators, uh, for example, used in a photonic uh, quantum computing applications. And here, uh, the, 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 the project goal basically is, is to develop an, an analog IC, uh, maybe uh, based on Global Foundry's um, FDSOI technology. And on this analog IC, all these um, components, uh, the drivers, the DACs and ADCs uh, will be um, integrated really on, on a high technology platform. And then since you have a very high uh, data uh, throughput, you need an additional data communication and management thing, which will be covered by an FPGA board. So there's another group which really uses their uh, know-how on the, on the design and the electrical control of MEMS and, and CMOS to, to put it in, in a new application like um, photonic quantum computing. And maybe as a last um, example from uh, a different platform, um, we, we um, have here the neutral atoms quantum computing. So on the, on the right, you see the, the approach from, from the Bloch group uh, where you really have uh, neutral atoms which are confined by light in a vacuum. And for this, uh, you, you need really adaptable and adjustable um, spatial light modulators. Um, at our institute, we have a group who developed uh, for years for different applications, really high performance uh, micro mirror arrays. And these are really um, perfect to, to be used in these applications because uh, they, they can be controlled analogless um, in, in an analog way, so not just binary, and they have a very high speed. They are really faster than, for example, LCDs, uh, which might be used uh, on other approaches. So on the left, you see some um, real-world realizations uh, of those MMAs, and in the middle, like a um, dynamic topography measurement of an array of such uh, micro mirrors. So um, I hope I was not too fast. So maybe it's my last slide as a takeaway message and already covering the, the epic question. Um, what can we offer? So basically we, we, we offer our infrastructure and, and our know-how and our competencies from the semiconductor manufacturing world, our 300 millimeter CMOS and 200 millimeter MEMS uh, infrastructure. Um, to, to look for new exciting ideas in the, in the field of quantum computing. So do you want to improve your technology? Do you look for some kind of pilot line or prototyping as a European solution? So that's basically um, where you can come to us. So we know how to put stuff on wafers. So we just need your ideas, basically. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Benjamin. So the reason why you were here today, just so you know, is that we really wanted to connect the photonics companies with the microelectronics companies. And there we saw uh, that you are involved in this amazing project. We are involved in the project that is today today silicon photonics at IPMS. And I saw that you provide actually silicon nitride on the top of electronics. Could you tell us a bit more about that? And is that something that you do vertically integrated that you do all yourself or are there any partners or most important, are you looking for new partners that we can introduce you to? Um, we were all, always looking for partners. Actually, uh, this, the slide you showed here, this, this is a bigger consortium with another Fraunhofer Institute to do the, the interposer and polymer part. And, and we, we will uh, realize the, the silicon nitride based part. So we will provide the PPU uh, with the silicon nitride based waveguides. Uh, um, face down um, flip basically on, on the polymer part and uh, we have a certain academia but uh, also some some industry partners who will probably not want to be named right now uh, in the end we are new for for the silicon photonics integrated thing for quant quantum computing so um, whoever thinks uh, our infrastructure and know-how can be used uh, we would be happy to to talk to what is the, the wavelength of operation of this uh, platform? Oh, uh, that's, I, I think it's, it's already too technical for me. So uh, I, I collected slides for, from different groups. So I, I have to, to get back to you with this. Sorry for this You know part. what? If you're looking for laser diodes, if you're looking for photodiodes, if you're looking for silicon nitride, if you're looking for silicon photonics, for lithium nitride, for indium phosphide, all the industries here to help you. They are all desperate to help you. So please come up with your challenges because this is something that we have been dreaming about to have ah, okay, okay. six companies dreaming up, which is bringing the photonics to them. I don't know. I have Martin Heck in the room from JEPIX and from Technical University of Eindhoven. Martin, are you still with us? Martin, one, two, three. He's texting me. All right, no, he's, he's not with us. But Martin I, and me, who have been working in the past on bringing indium phosphide as a, as a membrane on the top of electronics. And I think we believe that this is the way to go. Thank you very much for being with us. We want further integration with you and our network. We are going to be knocking at your door very, very soon. Congratulations, Benjamin, on what you are achieving. We Thank are you. almost at the end of this meeting. And of course, we always want to keep one of the best for the last. Today, we had the honor and pleasure to welcome for the first time at an epic meeting as a speaker, Richard Murray. We had Orca Computing before, but Richard Murray, the co-founder and CEO, is here with us to let us know how we can help them do even greater computing than they already do. Richard, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor and the attention of my 756 friends is yours. Uh -huh. Thanks, Jose, for that really awesome introduction. Oh dear, that's my, what's that? <laughs> um, so can you see my screen okay? Does that Very work? clear. Cool. Yeah, so uh, I don't have much time and I can't go over too much. So just to tell you a few words about our approach towards photonic quantum computing. So. I'm in the honor of following a, a number of really exciting talks. Uh, a number of things that I'll have to say very much line up with what the previous speakers have said. Um, I think our AUKUS approach is slightly different. So we're looking at integrating our quantum memory technology into photonic quantum computing systems. And that gives us a slightly different flavor. So rather than being on chip, um, rather than being integrated, AUKUS philosophy is about part integration maybe but more, more about modular components separated with optical fiber uh, uh optical fiber and so hopefully i'll elaborate a bit more on what that means and why that's important but i guess some of this community might get that actually if you can do things with modular components um some things are easier right so you can do sort of testing on individual components you can try and leverage things from the existing telecommunications supply chain and okay this stuff is hard trying to build a large scale quantum computer is hard so if you can um, leverage what's already out there in the form of you know existing telecoms components you know, our view is that that gives you an advantage in terms of building these building these systems up um, so just to dive into things what's happening yeah so i probably don't need to convince and the other speakers have already done this yeah, about the benefit of doing uh, quantum computing with photonics the only thing i would say to this community is I think we do need to convince people that photonics is you know, up there and a, and, a, and a leading platform alongside superconducting and, and iron trapping. I think probably all of us are familiar with sort of photonics being a bit different, especially when you're looking at 
these, these schemes of measurement based quantum computing. I think to our community, we do need to sort of align and persuade the government funders and other users of, of these systems that photonics really is as, as, as exciting as we all know it is. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the obvious reasons for that are clear. You know, and I think that um, the fact that quantum information is quite localized in other platforms um, gives that a clear reason why they will struggle to scale to large systems. Uh, unless they use photonics, like the really awesome talk from from IonQ, um, but you know, I think you know, and I was going to just spend a moment elaborating on why photonics is great, but also why photonics is hard. And you know, for those who are not familiar in the audience, photonics really is hard because, of course, two photons, you know, the photons don't really like interacting with each other. So when you want to build up large scale entangled states, uh, large cluster states, um, if you want to try and generate very um, stable resources for quantum computing, um, that stuff is, is hard for photonics. So it's quite hard for us to generate single photons as we're acting as qubits. But once we have them there, they're easy and powerful to use. So in, in a quick sort of cartoon, I describe it like this. So if, you know, as an example, if you try and generate a, a sort of resource state for quantum computing in the form of a lattice of, of single photons, even before you start entangling those, the key problem is that more often than not, you create a vacuum state, you create holes when you really want a stable array of, of single photons. And that means that if you want to try and entangle two qubits with each other, two, two photons, you'll be trying to entangle maybe one single photon with one single photon that doesn't happen to be there. So it's actually quite fundamentally challenging that to scale this stuff up, you need a reliable resource, it, it makes sense. Um, and so, you know, Orca's approach to solving that problem is to introduce a quantum memory, so the ability to store and release single photons without introducing any extra noise. And what you can do then, if you have that re as a resource, is you can perform what we call temporal multiplexing, which is where you sacrifice clock speed in order to sort of buffer operations in order to, de to deliver this much more stable and deterministic resource. Um, so hopefully that slide is clear. You're sort of taking the signal you get when you've successfully generated a single photon and you've used that to enable your memory, which then turns on and captures just that one single photon and then releases it deterministically. Um, so I have to say, you know, in the spirit of, you know, engaging with the supply chain, this is our, this is our key philosophy, but really to enable this, I think none of the uh, photonic quantum computing providers would argue with the fact that you know, this deterministic resource is the fundamental challenge of scaling up a photonic quantum computing system. And, and it is hard. So the, 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 the quantity of determinism you need needs to be very high. So you need to generate a single photon with you know, very high probability, 99.9% .9 and, and upwards, or, or very high. Um, so actually, the, the, the way that Orca is approaching this is to start with Orca memory and temporal multiplexing but also we have a view to throw as much as you can at this. So spectral multiplexing, spatial multiplexing. Um, and in order to do that, it helps being able to leverage stuff already out there in the, in the supply chain. So that, that, I don't know if how many people are familiar with that. That's the key challenge with photonic quantum computing. Um, this is the memory, you know, this, as I mentioned, the ability to store and release single photons. And um, it, it, I'd like to, I'm happy to say it is up and working in the Orca lab. So we do, have demonstrated the, this ability that we mentioned to increase the likelihood of being able to retrieve a single photon by using a quantum memory. Um, and it's demonstrating some quite short storage times, but in our view, enough to being, being to, to, given that the sort of photonics clock speed is very, very high enough to, to perform that synchronization operation. So think, things are looking, th looking pretty good for Orca. So this is back to my point about just, and this is quite a big sort of philosophical uh, point behind Orca is just you know, really trying to leverage as much as you can from the existing telecommunications supply chain. So we do already use optical fiber uh, and our optical switches. And I'm sure this audience have a lot to say about optical switches and other sort of uh, multiplexing devices combined with our quantum memory technology and um, and uh, off-the-shelf detector systems. In our view, that just gives you, a, uh, firstly, the ability to 
um, manipulate single photons without introducing as much noise. You know, it helps being able to use mature components when you really need to drive down the loss and noise uh, properties of single photons, as well as also helping with those things I mentioned already about the ability to work with modular components, just making everything less uh, all or nothing, uh, so less uh, sensitive to every single one of your detectors being fabricated properly. You can do more thorough testing, uh, testing regimes. Um, so how does that all come together in terms of quantum computing? So Orca actually has two approaches. So uh, like the previous speakers, we do have uh, a large, a, a growing team working on uh, error correction and what we call sort of uh, uh, spatially encoded quantum computing, which is our approach towards fault tolerance and, and error correction. Um, that involves you know, taking single photons and then combining them together to build up very large lattices of entangled photons and performing operations based on, on those. But I think what's nice about Orca is um, because we're doing it in this modular fashion, it is actually compatible with our business to both focus on the long-term view, this error correction view, but also to take those same components and try and explore this NISC regime that, that Mark talked about earlier. So the sort of, what can you do with a few hundred qubits? And although I will ag agree that, you know, the most interesting challenges are, are solved with very large scale quantum computing systems. I, I think it's right to say that no one quite knows and no one could say with certainty that smaller scale systems definitely cannot be useful. So it's sort of a bit of a wild west. It's a bit more of an unknown about what can be done with smaller scale systems. And that's something that Orca is also exploring with our ability to take, uh, manipulate single photons in time. So use time as a, a resource for quantum computing. Um, and in this space, in the, our approach towards near-term sort of systems, we're very much looking at machine learning and what quantum systems could be could do within a within a much wider machine learning system. So I guess imagine now you know, moving away from your quantum system doing everything, and in fact more relying on the fact that you might have a very large classical system doing machine learning. Now, if you take that system, can the quantum system offload a very small part of the workload? In order to try and accelerate that and i will say you know this, this stuff is hard it's just it's very cutting edge it's not definitely clear we can produce an advantage but it's so interesting and obviously the application of machine learning is so widespread in my view for the for an, the orca's philosophy it's it's useful for us to try and approach that as an as an application and try and do something in the near term um which would which would be incredibly important to a number of different uh companies um so we've already got some results. We've got uh, you know, ways of doing portfolio optimization and sort of optimization. Um, and what's nice, the company has built up a sort of software library, an SDK and an emulator system, which is pretty advanced. So if people want to explore how they can use a photonics system in the near term and explore applications, maybe even if they're, they're more machine learning, uh, their, their skills are from the machine learning environment, we have a nice SDK uh, toolkit that allows people to get used to and run uh, emulators of quantum systems without really knowing you know, the detailed, having any detailed understanding of, um, qu of quantum. So I am rushing through this because we're sort of running out of time, but the final thing I wanted to say is Orca is very much a, a company that believes that uh, any type of quantum computing system, large or small, will need to be very closely interlinked with classical high performance computing. And either on the short term, that will be because there's some of the workload being processed by a classical computer, or in the long term, because maybe some of the work is being carried out by a classical computer, but also there's, there are error correction uh, uh, algorithms being run, and those typically require a lot of processing. So Orca very much believes that it does make sense for this in community to engage with what's already out there, the, the classical high performance computing industry. So we have a nice project we've just won with in the UK to work with BT to integrate and look at integration of quantum systems with classical high performance computing. So, so that was it. Very quick talk. Apologies for rushing through things. I didn't have much time. You know, the leadership team might you might be familiar with. We've got a really great sort of collective team uh, spanning sort of business and commercial through to atom optics and machine learning. So if you wanted to know any more. I'd be happy to talk to you. We want to know Thanks. much, much more, Ray Richard. Thank you so much for 
for this fantastic presentation. Thank you for being here because now is the most important part of the meeting. We want to connect you with companies. So tell us about the epic question. How can we help you? Yeah, well, I mean, we're very engaged with the telecoms industry. So, you know, low, as Mark was saying, very low loss, high speed switches. There's a lot going on in the telecoms industry and Orca's keen to just work with components providers on, on that side of things. I was really interested when someone mentioned their, uh, their lithium nibate um, foundry. That's also pretty interesting from us. for us. We do a lot with lithium nibate. Um, so generally, I would say cutting edge telecoms components providers. If you fancy sort of really stretching what you think you can do with your components, it would be great to talk to you. here, they want to talk to you. Amir Gadimi, they, they, they want to find a partnership on lithium nibate. What, what are you doing there in, in Sweden and how can you get them as a, as a partner? Swiss. Uh, well, do you want me to share like quickly one slide or shall I go like Ultra this? Ultrafast photonics, uh, you always remember. Okay. So as thank you. As fast as it moderates. Yeah, yeah. First of all, like, you know, maybe can you see my slides? Crystal clear. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, one maybe one uh, uh, sort of difference, we are not doing just lithium nibet in the sense of a bulk lithium nibet technology. Uh, which one do you see? Is it? Uh, you see the wrong one. The wrong one. Okay. I always have to. How about now? Yes, is it perfect. Good? Perfect. So what we are working is actually, yeah, so, so develop the first open foundry on uh, lithium nibate on the insulator. Uh, so this is a thin films of lithium nibate. And, uh, you know, so, so I, I mean, I don't have you know, so much time to introduce it, but yeah, indeed, lithium nibate is uh, one of the very interesting materials for integrated photonic circuits. It has this uh, very high electro-optic coefficients, enable us to do ultra-fast modulations, you know, above 100 gigahertz at very efficiently, actually, with low VPIs. I think this, you know, fast switching several times was already actually brought up, uh, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this panel and this is one of the you know unique things that actually with lithium nibate we can do very fast and very I mean very uh, efficient uh, and very compact. And uh, what I can tell is also you know for, for this quantum computing community lithium nibate also comes with a very strong chi two and chi three nonlinearities, and this is quite important because you know for example through processes such as SPDC we can actually you know, easily on the same die generate uh, photon pairs. But also for people who want to use, uh, you know, single photon sources, we can actually use this capability for wavelength conversion using PPLNs. So right now at CSCM, we have a, you know, sort of a six inch process, quite a stable process to make a lithium nibate photonic integrated circuits. And at the moment, actually we are working uh, on our first version of the PDK. So the foundry is not entirely, you know, completely commercialized right now. We are offering it as a sort of a, pre-commercial access to people like alpha users who want to test uh, you know, our platform before it's you know, fully public. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really actually interested uh, you know, to follow up with uh, some of the people here in, in case of modulators or- uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Amir, for that. And I, I, I must tell that uh, right now, I'm very happy that we have all the, all the photonic platforms in the room with the silicon nitrate, lichen tech, and Lionics. We had the indium phosphate from Jepix. We had the silicon photonics platform. So Orca Computing, you knock at the right door looking for technologies to incorporate. And Richard, continue doing what you're doing and you're going to be challenged by many of the companies who want to get in touch with you. What I would like to say to all of you today is that our goal was in the beginning to compare compare superconductors with ions, with diamond, with photonics. I think at the end of the meeting, I realized that this is perhaps irrelevant, but I saw photonics opportunities in the four of them. What I also saw is that industry in the photonic side is moving really, really, really fast. And today we already have demonstrators. We had demonstrators looking for people to use them at different environments. I was extremely happy to see Quicks. I was extremely happy to see Ipronics saying we already had the platform, come here and use it. Let's try to use, let's try to make those connections. And still, I think the main conclusion I have from the companies who are presenting photonic solutions is that the main challenge still remains on the fast switching and especially with low insertion losses. So we do have technologies in Epic to help on that. I'm amazed to what Lion Tech is doing and amazed with the companies from NSGD with Lionix is doing. Let's all work together to help those companies do that. Once again, Psy Quantum, Orca Computing, Quantum Brilliance, Quicks, everyone that was today at the meeting, thank you for making our life epic. Until the next time, see you later. Bye bye. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. 
if you are in our Zoom room or informal private discussion is about to start. I call it virtual drinks with friends. And we all know follow up is important. But for now, if you are watching on YouTube, that's where we leave you for today. Thanks to the Epic Production crew and all the sponsors for making today's event possible. More details about upcoming meetings are on our website. And if you want to get in touch with any of the participants, all you have to do is contact me directly and I will make sure you get introduced. It is all about connections. Thanks for being Epic.